May this message lead you to a deep reflection on the processes and tools of self-transformation provided by the renowned Yogi Sadhguru. If you want to start your yoga journey with Sadhguru, click on the link in the description of this video and learn more. An appreciation of this commendable cause that the Dharma Foundation has taken up, I would like to say that for thousands of years, for the longest period compared to anything on this planet, this wisdom, this dimension of knowing has lived on without any kind of true organization or a certain kind of leadership or any other kind of organized support. Out of sheer efficacy of what it is, it's just lived on. A time has come in the world when… where even truth has to be protected. When we talk about East, we are not talking about a particular geography. This must be clearly understood. We are not talking about East and West as geographical features in the world. Any number of uh, great minds in America have said things of great reverence and admiration for the so-called Eastern wisdom. Toro, one of the greatest minds America produced, went out to say, every morning I bathe my intellect in this stupendous and cosmogonal knowledge from the East. In comparison, all our modern world and literature is puny and trivial. I think Mark Twain went out to probably gave out the best compliment to the East. When he visited India for a little over three months, he said, anything that can ever be done, either by man or God, has been done in this land. Any number of others, Oppenheimer, Walden, Emerson, any number of people have said many, many things. Why? Why is it impo important? Why is it important to preserve and nurture this dimension of life? The fundamental reason why it seems to be so significantly different is because it is not a product of human intellect. It is not deductions that we made out of our intellect. This dimension comes from a profound inner experience where there is no right and wrong, there is no up and down, just seeing things the way they are. And when we say dharma, we are not talking about a religion as modern translators went about interpreting dharma as Hindu dharma or whatever, another religion. Because they came from a mindset that everybody has to belo belong to some segment of humanity. They come from a mindset where humanity has to be divided one way or the other. Because they come from the surface intelligence of human nature, which we call as intellect. Unfortunately, the modern societies, modern education systems 
have entirely dedicated themselves to the human intellect, completely ignoring other dimensions of intelligence which definitely exist within us. When you go by the intellect, the nature of the intellect is always to dissect and divide because intellect is essentially discriminatory in nature. An intellect functions always with a certain identity. If you have no identity, you cannot use your intellect. So with individual identities, either of race, religion, nationality, caste, creed, gender, when you apply your intellect, it will split the world into many pieces. So the significance of what we are referring to as the spirit of Eastern wisdom is, it does not come from human intellect. It comes from a deeper dimension of intelligence within us. When I say a deeper dimension of intelligence, a simplistic way of looking at it would be, whatever you had for lunch today, if you had a piece of bread, over the afternoon this bread is being transformed into a human being. You definitely cannot do that with your intellect. There's an intelligence here which is capable of making a banana into a human being. You definitely cannot do that with your intellect. A dimension of intelligence which is beyond thought process. Thought or the product of intellect is essentially always functioning from a limited amount of data that we have gathered. Now, what we call as Eastern wisdom is not coming from a limited amount of data that we have gathered either from the books or our life experience, but simply by enhancing our ability to perceive life in ways that the five sense organs cannot function. Why I'm talking about the five sense organs is, all the data that you have ever gathered, which rests in so many aspects within you, which is the food for the intellect, comes from the five sense organs. In the very nature of things, sense organs cannot perceive the entirety of anything. If you can see this part of my hand, you cannot see this part of my hand. This is the nature of sense perception. Even if you take a grain of sand, if you see one part of it, you cannot see the other face of it. Sense organs can only perceive in comparison. If there is no comparison, your senses are useless. Because there is darkness, you know what is light. Otherwise, you just would not know what is light. If light was on all the time and there was no darkness, you would not know what is light. Because there is silence, you know what is sound. If there was no silence, you would not have the idea of what is sound. So always in comparison, it is like, let's say you're six feet tall. Now, you walk like a tall man, you think like a tall man, you feel like a tall man, you are a tall man. You went to another society where everybody is eight feet tall. Suddenly you walk like a short man, think like a short man, feel like a short man and you are a short man. So what you perceive in comparison is a distortion of reality. It is not reality as it is. So whatever we perceive in comparison is useful for our survival process. But if we want to know, know the nature of this existence, sense organs are not sufficient instruments. What is light for you is darkness for many other creatures. You ever got into an argument with an owl? <laughs> if you did, which is light, which is darkness, where would it go? It would be endless argument. Who is right, you or the owl? Hmm? 
Oh, if you're saying both, either you belong to the diplomatic corps <laughs> or you have a successful marriage. You have learned to say both, both, both for everything. <laughs> you're right. Well, that is the basis of all the problems on the planet. I am right and you are wrong <laughs> The fact of the matter is, you are perceiving it as it is necessary for your survival. The owl is perceiving it as it is necessary for his survival. If survival is all you're seeking, your five sense organs and intellect are sufficient instruments. But if you want to know the nature of the existence, if you want to know the fundamental laws or dharma which governs life, the way it happens within us and around us, then you need an inner perception or another dimension of intelligence within you. Otherwise, you will only cut the world into pieces. In the name of religions, we have cut the world into humanity. An intelligence which is simply exploding into everything possible. If you are in rhythm with it, you will rise. If you are not in rhythm with it, it will crush you. It has no love, it has no compassion, it has no intention of helping you, it has no intention of harming you, it has no nothing. If you understand the forces and ride it, you have a fantastic life. If you do not understand, it will crush you. You've seen people doing surfboarding on the waves in the ocean. It is such a magical thing, just riding the waves. But if you don't do it right, if you go into the waves, it's like being in a concrete mixer, it'll just do that and it'll kill you. So one rides the wave, another gets crushed by the wave, that is all that's happening. The rest is all human interpretations. This is the first thing we have to stop, that we do not extend our thought and emotion to the existence. This is relevant between you and me. This is relevant between you and your family members. You love them, I love you, you love me, all this fine. Don't look up at the sky and say, I love you. <laughs> it will not say, I love you back, <laughs> because it has no such need. It's pure existence. This is what you have to become if you sit here, you are a complete existence by yourself. This is a full-fledged life. It does not need anything from anybody. It has everything. It is connected with everything in the universe. It does not need anything. But we want to play our games, okay? We can do all this stuff. But you need to understand right now, we are trying to extend our compulsions to the whole creation. It doesn't work like that. Existence is not trying to help you. You may be in tune with it, Bingo, you are. Whether you got in tune with it consciously or unconsciously, somehow you got in tune. That's why Sankara said, Yogaratava, Bhogaratava. That means somehow you do it, I don't care. Your Sankara, Adi Sankara went to the extent of somehow you do it. You get it, man, that's important. <laughs> How you get it, who cares? <laughs> Sadhguru, I am constantly between my senior colleagues who are extremely skilled surgeons. Uh, Sadhguru, the, on the heart there are some procedures which are done by very few people on this planet. I'll, I'll give an example. I do an operation called pulmonary endarterectomy. That's the, the blood clots from the leg goes to the lung arteries and it clogs up all the arteries. So 20, 25 years ago there was no cure for this. And once you're diagnosed, you're destined to die within a year. Today, people who are on home oxygen for two years, three years, you do the operation, they can go back to skydiving or they can go to scuba diving. That's the transformative effect. But there are only 50 surgeons, less than 50 surgeons in this world who can operate. And like this, we have some of my colleagues who are extremely gifted surgeons. They are in their fifties now and some of them are constantly talking about retirement. Especially one surgeon who is an extremely gifted surgeon who can fix any damaged valve. He is single, he has no other commitments, 
Every other day, he talks about going to Benares or like somewhere and retire. And I keep telling him that God didn't create him to retire and meditate. He has to be fixing all these problems. <laughs> So he gives me extension every six months, uh, Guruji. <laughs> so at the end of six months, the usual rigmarole starts. He talks about retirement and everybody is depressed in the hospital. <laughs> so how do you deal with this kind of people? <laughs> you, must, uh, you must give him a one-year sabbatical with me. Yes, <laughs> because uh, the, the need or the idea of retirement enters anybody's mind because of the monotony of what they're doing, whatever it may be. Somebody else may think it's a great thing, but in your experience somewhere it's becoming monotonous or stagnant. Stagnation is one thing that human intelligence and human system cannot take. And most of the ailments are because of stagnation, stagnation of life. They may be… they may be getting their, uh, you know, once in three years promotion, they may be making little more money, all these things may be happening. But somewhere experientially there is a stagnation, which could be a major cause for many of the complex ailments that people manufacture within the systems. The more complex they get, you try to create more talented surgeons. I'm saying we are manufacturing the problems, we are trying to manufacture a solution. I think as we offer solutions, people who have already gotten into problems, they need solution. But it's very important that we teach people how not to create these problems. So that instead of fifty, you have to produce five thousand expert surgeons to attend to all these people who are on self-help to illness. So I would say a surgeon who's, who, ha who has a certain competence and who has worked through his life, if he wants to explore something of his own nature, that would be the greatest thing to do because he's not a man without commitment, not competence. When competence and commitment is there, you should not run him through the rigram role and destroy that possibility. It's important that he explores something of his own nature which will make him… we don't know what he'll come up with. You cannot even estimate what he may come up with <laughs> But otherwise in every cell in the body there is air. So when you say air, it's not just the breath. Six percent air is in every cell in the body. Just remove it a little bit from the brain, it'll be good. It's good if it's in the lungs, in the heart, in the muscles. They function better if there is oxygen, you know? You know this, if you're oxygen deprived, muscles become rigid because this needs air, otherwise it'll not work. So, water is seventy-two percent. <laughs> so maximum care should be taken about the water because it's seventy-two percent. If you are going to an examination, suppose uh, it is like this, let's say you're going for physics examination. You have water, earth, this, that, but just the water subject is for seventy-two marks. Naturally you spend more time reading about water, isn't it? Studying water, yes or no? Air is only six percent, you may not study because you are okay with ninety-four. Water you must study because it's seventy-two percent. You must take enormous care about the water because it's seventy-two percent, still substantial, isn't it? So how food goes into you, from whose hands it comes to you, how you eat it, how you approach it, all these things are important. Then comes your air, six percent. In that six percent, only one percent or less is your breath. 
rest is happening in so many other ways. And it's important, especially if you have children, at least once a month, take them out somewhere, not to the damn cinema, again breathing everybody's nonsense. <laughs> the air gets affected just by the sounds and the intentions and the emotions, all the rubbish that's happening on the screen and all the rubbish that's reflecting in human minds of violence, of sex, of greed, of this and that, is affecting that limited air in that hall in a tremendous way. So instead of taking them to the cinema, take them to the river, teach them how to swim, climb a mountain, where is mountain Sadhguru? Himalayas is so far away. Even a small hill is a mountain for your boy, yes? Even a little rock, just go climb and sit on one of them. Children will enjoy it immensely, they will become fit, you will become fit. And above all, your body and mind will function differently. And above all, you are in touch with the creator's creation, which is the most important thing. Not your own rubbish that you made. Yes, it's comfortable right now, but it's not everything. So instead of going to the restaurant, instead of going to the cinema, instead of going somewhere else like that, at least once a month, it doesn't cost anything. Huh? Doesn't cost anything. You can take your rice and aukai and go and eat there. <laughs> anyway, you have it. You don't have to spend money on this. Even better, if you don't want to spend money even on the bus or car, all of you cycle just three kilometers, five kilometers outside Hyderabad, sit on one rock, just spend time there, feel the sun. It's very important you get some sun, air, good water. Come back, you are doing Bhuta Shuddhi in a very natural way. It is not the ultimate type of Bhuta Shuddhi, but you are doing some Bhuta Shuddhi. This is what I was saying just now. If you take care of food, water, air is not always in your hands because you are living in a city. But water and food you can take care. And what kind of fire burns within you, that also you can take care. Sunlight has not become impure, isn't it? Get some sunlight every day, please. Get some sun on your body every day because sunlight is still pure, isn't it? Nobody can fortunately contaminate it. And what kind of fire burns within you? Is it the fire of greed, fire of hatred, fire of resentment, fire of anger, fire of love, fire of compassion? What kind of fire burns within you? You take care of that, then you don't worry about your physical and mental well-being. It's taken care of. I've spoken in the prisons, I've spoken in many places <laughs> So you're here willingly. You're doing something willingly is the fundamental of your joy, isn't it so? Hello? However simple or stupid or idiotic activity it is, I'm doing something willingly makes a world of difference, isn't it so? Hello? The difference between heaven and hell is just this, you're doing something willingly, that's your heaven. You're doing something unwillingly, that's your hell. Hmm? We have already taken on attitudes, what we like and what we don't like. I like this person, I don't like this person. Now with this person I will do things willingly, with this person I'll do things un unwillingly. This may be two people, two aspects of life, two communities, to nations, to many things. This I will do willingly, this I do unwillingly. This means I've decided in my mind this is good, this is bad. When I hear even on national news channels, good guys and bad guys, it just… Once you have this kind of thing, you are going to be disastrous to the planet, it's just a question of time. The moment you decide this is a good person, this is a bad person, this has gone deep into American society. No, there are no good people and bad people. Everybody is oscillating between the two. 
if you create a very pleasant, wonderful atmosphere, everybody behaves wonderfully. If you create an unpleasant atmosphere, a whole lot of people act nasty. Mm -hmm. This is how the world is. If you think what you're doing is very significant, you learn to work with all kinds of people. That's you will true. see horrible people will do wonderful things. Yes? Mm -hmm. yes? Yes. Yes. But if you want to work with ideal people, you won't find any. I haven't found one yet. <laughs> there are all kinds of mixed bags, yes. but <laughs> if you are willing that you are not yes and no, yes to one, no to another, you're simply one big yes, you will find a way. <laughs> Thank you so much. That I, I, I always say that it's the resistance <laughs> Just do this one simple exercise. If you do this, you will live a worthwhile life, believe me. If you sleep in that condition, you will wake up with much more light, with much more energy. Generally, in India they told you, you should not put your head to the north and sleep. Hmm? You're aware of this? If you put your head to the north and sleep during the night when, you, when you're in horizontal positions, then slowly the blood will get pulled towards your brain. When there is too much circulation in the brain, you cannot sleep peacefully. If you have any kind of, you know, inherently weak aspects in your brain or if you're of old age, you could die in your sleep. One can have hemorrhage because extra blood is trying to enter the brain where the blood vessels are hair-like. Something extra is being pushed because of the magnetic pull. When you're in a vertical position, this is not so. The moment you become horizontal, this pull on the head is so strong that slowly the blood tries to move towards the brain. So to avoid this, this is true only in the Northern Hemisphere. If you go to Australia, you should not put your head to the South. If you're in India, you should not put your head to the North. You can put it any other way, it's okay. You can incubate a lot of either negative things or positive things in sleep. This is getting too easy, just sleeping sadhana. So coming awake to an alarm bell with a sudden start is not the best way to do your life. How many of you find uh, that one day morning when you get up without any reason, you're just feeling ugly for no reason? If it is happening even at least two, three times a year, if it is, then you must do certain things before you go to bed, it's very, very important. Because unconsciously, you need to understand this, you can incubate a lot of either negative things or positive things in sleep. Either pleasantness or unpleasantness, you can incubate very effectively, uninterrupted in sleep. You can also incubate it in the day, but there are so many interruptions, it doesn't happen very efficiently. But if you have a tendency to go to bed in a certain way and you wake up in the morning really nasty for simply no reason, that means you're incubating things in the night very efficiently. Bad eggs. This is not just about psychological disturbances, it can cause major physiological problems over a period of time. It's, it's important that you eliminate these things from your life. So, before you go to bed in the night, there are certain things that you need to take care of. It's best if you're eating meat and other kinds of meals, you eat at least three to four hours before you go to bed. The digestion is over. Before going to bed, drink a certain amount of water and go to bed. You will see 
it gets taken care of just like this. One simple thing can be just a shower, always to shower before you go to bed, it'll make a lot of difference. In this weather, maybe cold showers are difficult, so you go for lukewarm showers, don't go for hot showers in the night, go for lukewarm showers, it makes you alert. So you will think, oh, I cannot sleep. It doesn't matter, you will sleep fifteen, twenty minutes or half an hour later, but you will sleep better because it will take away certain things. When you shower, it is not just the dirt on the skin that you're taking away. Have you noticed if you're very tense and anxious, whatever, just a shower, you came out and feels like almost the burden has been taken away from you? Have you not noticed this? So it's not just about washing the skin, a whole lot of things happen when water flows over your body. This shower is a very rudimentary bhuti shuddhi because over seventy percent of your body is actually water. If you run water over it, a certain purification happens which is beyond cleaning the skin. I'm talking about attention not even about something, just being attentive. In the yogic systems, we have what is called as dashavadhanis, shatavadhanis. What this means is, a man will do ten things at the same time. Now, when you don't miss a thing, everybody thinks you're some kind of a superhuman being. We can give you very uh, dynamic processes through which you can scale up your attention to a higher and higher level. My question is, what means focus to you in, and which way can we apply focus in our daily life? So, what's your definition of focus? Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, there are many ways to describe this word. Instead of saying focus, if you use the word attention, would you agree that attention and focus are about the same thing? There is a little difference, there is… there are nuances to it, but when you say focus, it's just like focusing a light on something means only a focus is always a spot. Attention can be much more widespread. See, right now, if you have clear vision, I am having problems seeing the young man because you kept him in darkness there in the hall <laughs> But if the hall was well lit, I don't have to focus myself to see the people who are sitting here. I just need attention. If I am attentive, I will see all the people here the way they are. But now I get interested in this one young man, then I need focus. If I had only focus without the general attention about everything around me, indiscriminate attention I'm talking about, attention not even about something, just being attentive because only because there is a certain level of attention and awareness within you, you even know that you exist. Otherwise, let's say in sleep, in your experience, neither the world exists nor you exist, all that's happened is there is no attention, because there is no attention, there is no perception of any kind. He could not do his best because he couldn't handle the situations and the realities of life at the age of thirty-seven, what he should be. I think Messi handled that situation of his age gracefully and I think it paid off for him. And it's not all in his hands, the team and the situations, the opposition teams, many, many things are there. So if you want to see in the finals, is Bappe better or Messi better, Bappe is way better. He's playing like Pillay, all right? But things didn't work. Things didn't work, he's only twenty-three. He's moving faster than almost anybody in the entire tournament, but couldn't win. In the end, that's all that matters. This is what you need to understand, what we are doing in our lives is not all ours. Many things are there, it's happened to you many times, you hit the tree but it went on the green. Oh, that's how you win <laughs> It happens, you hit… you think you hit a great shot but it bounced somewhere else. 
you hit a bad shot but it came back where it should be. Well, all these factors are there. So don't go looking for luck hitting the trees, no, you do your best. What happens is not all yours, that goes for even the best champions of champions, all right? No question. So it's not right at any time that you don't pose this question even to yourself, am I better than the guy who's sitting next to you? Don't do this. What is the best I can do, that's all. 